Everybody, we are about to get a little bit wacky because we're talking about those selection structures again, but more complicated versions of them. However, with slightly more complicated comes more power. We can do a lot more things with them. So let's get into it. We're talking about F4.7, F4.8, and F4.9 in this. So the first thing I want to talk about is nested selection structures. I talked about how structures can contain other structures. We've already kind of seen uh, sequence structures containing selection structures. But, and of course we've also seen uh, selection structures containing sequence structures. But we can also have nested selection structures where selection structures are contained inside of other selection structures. Now this is going to be really useful for us if we, in say one of the true or false paths, if we need to make further decisions inside of those, if our decisions are a little more complicated and it's not easy to express them as much in a uh, Boolean condition, or if a bunch of things need to happen inside of one of the paths before getting to the nested structure, or stuff like that. like. It lets us have additional options for choices. We don't need to just do one or the other. We can have uh, one choice, but then that choice has its own choices and gives us more of a variety. So that's more power in our code. Here's a flowchart for an application that um, uses nested selection structures in order to determine if the user is eligible to vote. Start off by getting the user's age and also asking the user if they are registered to vote. Now, if the user's age is uh, less than or equal to 18, this condition right here, int age is greater than or equal to 18, right? This whole thing is false, so we display the message, you are too young to vote. It goes down here and the procedure ends. Um, if it's true, if they are greater than or equal to 18, they might be eligible to vote. However, that's not guaranteed. Because to be able to vote, there's a few conditions. Uh, the two that are represented here are whether the user is over 18 and whether they are already registered to vote. They have to be registered in order to actually be able to cast a vote. So if the age is 18, if it's been confirmed that they are 18 years old, then under the true path, the uh program asks you know are you registered to vote and they check if it's equal to yes now hypothetically you could put like the string you could uh check just text register dot text in the solution chart and then put the letter y and then put some other thing that says anything else that's not y whatever but in this case you know we only have two options anyway, it's true or false, and we're already checking if it's equal to y, so why not? Not an intentional play on words or pun or whatever there. However, if they are over eight, uh, equal to or, or greater than 18, but they are not registered to vote, we don't need to tell them that they're too young to vote, so we can just say you must register to vote, or register before you can vote. So what we have are two different messages that we're displaying to the user, which is really helpful because if we just had a regular selection structure where we ask, are you greater than or equal to 18 and are you registered to vote as a Boolean condition, right? And then if it was false because one of those, at least one of those conditions failed, if we just gave them an error message that says, you do not meet the requirements to vote because we don't have a way of saying you're too young, or you have to register. We just said, you can't vote. That's not helpful to the user. So the nested selection structure actually makes it easy for us because we can give these different pieces of feedback to the user. Or even if it wasn't feedback to the user, right? We could do whatever calculations we need to do that is specific for this case where it's both greater than or equal to 18 age, and also not registered to vote, like, you know. So that's where nested 
has a lot of power. And then, of course, if they are registered, we display your good to vote message. In either of these cases, you know, they meet up together at the bottom like we would expect for a uh, dual selection structure. And then they come down here and meet up with this path right here, which is also what we would expect for one of these dual structures. And then no matter what, it all ends. So that's what a nested selection, selection structure looks like in flowchart form, is we're putting an if statement within an if statement. And then some pseudocode, of course, declaring variables. If the value in a age is at least 18, then check if, it, check if text uh, registered contains y, or you know is equal to y, really. Um, if, you know, if we're right here, we already know that the user is at least 18 years old because we're in the true path. And then if this is true, we're, we know that we're inside the true path inside the true path, so both options, you know, both statements were correct. The user is good to vote. They are both 18 and also registered, so we can display you can vote. However, if we end up in this else block, we still know that we're inside the true path of the outer loop. However, we're in the false path of the inner loop, which means true path of the outer loop, they're old enough, false path of the inner loop, they're not registered. So we have to tell them that they have to register to vote. And then we end if down here, we end this inner if statement. Now notice the inner if statement is indented at the same level as any other if statement block. And this end if right here, Visual Basic is going to assume it applies to this if, the if on its level. You know, when it goes when it goes up, it's like the first if that it sees that's not inside of it, right? So this end if comes here, which means that we're done with all the statement, like we're done with this inner if statement, and then we hit else, and it says, okay, well, we're done with the true path of the outer loop, so we jump down here and run any code down here, which there is none. However, if this value is less than 18, then we jump to else. We go down the false path. Because we're in the false path of the outer loop, we know that the user was too young, so we give them the you are too young to vote message, and then we end if and we get out of there. Here's another flowchart example of the exact same program that does the exact same thing. In this case, it's checking if the user is less than 18 in the outer one first. And if that's true, you display you are too young to vote. So now the, the, the difference here, the only difference here is that the true path and the false path of the outer loop have changed places. In the true path of the outer loop, they're uh, less than 18. This is true, so they're less than 18, so we display too young to vote. If this is false, that means they're greater than or equal to 18, which means they're old enough to vote, which then means we check registration, and that whole thing works exactly the same. And if you want an exercise, you can write out the pseudocode for this version of the nested selection structure example. Well, I hope you wrote the pseudocode already because here's the actual code that the textbook gives for their example. In the first case, nested, the nested structure in the outer structure's true path right here. The second is the nested structure in the outer structure's false path. So, uh, you know, it gives you those examples, but they are remarkably similar. Now, what might be helpful for you if you are using a nested structure like this is inside of the innermost selection structure, if you put a comma saying what everything that has been true or false in order to get you there. For example, right above putting you can vote, you could say uh, user is over 18 and they are registered. In this else right here, where they're trying to, uh, where we're trying to give them the register before you vote, you could put the comment, "User is 18 but not registered to vote." In this here else block here, you can say, "User is not 18 or older," and that can be really helpful for keeping track of what information you know so that you can actually do the right action. You know 
when you're trying to tell them that they can vote, well, you know that they are over or equal to 18, and also that they are registered. So they're valid to vote, which means that you can tell them to vote. You're not, like, accidentally telling someone that they can vote when they're not able to, maybe because they're too young or something. So you can use comments to keep track of all the information that you know, which means that you're able to make assumptions based on where you are in these selection structures, which can be really helpful. Uh, it can make calculations a lot simpler based on the assumptions that you're able to make based on the conditions and the data and all that kind of stuff. A uh, similar thing here, if we wanted to, over the you can vote label, put a comment describing what's going on, we can put a comment saying user is greater than or user is at least 18 and is registered to vote. Something like that. And this will be really helpful as selection structures get more and more complicated, which, you know, if you have four layers of nested structures, which God forbid you have four layers of nested structures, that's kind of disgusting. But if you have four layers of nested structures, you might want to keep track of everything because that is a lot of possibilities right there. So you got to be careful. Um, or when we talk about the other structures in this video, it's useful for keeping track of all that as well. For example, we have the multiple alternative selection structures. Because some procedures are going to require more than just one or two paths. Sometimes you have a situation where you can't just boil it down to a true path, or you can't just boil it down to a true path or false path. You need more. You need A path, B path, C path, D path, etc, etc. So multiple alternative selection structures allow you to create as many as you want. I talked about radio buttons before. These are really good for radio buttons because one example of using multiple alternative selection structures is that you can say, well, if this button out of the group of four is clicked, do this. Versus if this one is clicked, do this. Versus if this one is clicked, do this. Versus if this one is clicked, do this. Right? So that can be really really helpful. Here's an example of a multiple alternative selection structure. Um, this is for a program where you type in the designation of the warehouse. It's going to be A, B, C, D, or something, you know, maybe the user types in something random. But the warehouses for this company are designated warehouse A, warehouse B, etc, etc. And your program is trying to convert that warehouse designation to the state that they are located in. Warehouse A is in Tennessee, Warehouse B is in Kentucky, and both warehouses C and D are in Louisiana. Now, of course, we have our sort of dis decision structure part of the flowchart, but instead of saying, is string warehouse equal to A? We're saying, what is string warehouse? If it's equal to A, if string warehouse is equal to A is a true claim, do this, display Tennessee. If it's equal to B, display Kentucky. If it's equal to C, or if it's equal to D, display Louisiana. If it's something else, display not applicable. And then in any case, they all meet up at the very end and stop. But we have this like branching out path where each of these paths are labeled with the value that we are expecting them to be. And it might not just be a value, it might be a condition as well but we'll get to that. Here's some pseudocode. We declare the string warehouse variable, store the warehouse designation in the string warehouse variable. If the value in the string warehouse variable is one of the following, if it's A, display Tennessee. If it's B, display Kentucky. If it's C, or if it's D, display Louisiana. Otherwise, if it's something else, display not applicable. And then we end if. You might notice, end if and if, and else, and stuff. Might, you know, we might see some familiar faces when we're talking about this multiple alternative stuff. Uh, but here is another way of doing pseudocode. Um, this is similar to how an if statement is structured here, where we have if, and then some condition, and then the thing you do if the condition is true. But now we have an else, and then it looks like we start a new if statement, which might make you think nested loops. But with this, we're not talking about nested loops at all. Multiple alternative selection structures is not nested loops. It is one structure that can handle multiple things. 
So think of this as the different arms in the flowchart. This is the second arm where we test if it's B. The third arm if we test if it's C or D. And so on and so forth. So that's another way of representing it. Uh, pseudocode is up to your style, so you are welcome to do it however you want. And of course, we return to our old friend if then else. But we have more toys to play with. Because we can include the optional else if block for multiple alternative stuff in order to test multiple conditions inside of the same if block. We don't have to worry about nested structures for everything. I mean, there's times where they are useful, but we don't need to worry about them for everything because this lets us specify those additional conditions. The idea is we have our if statement, if condition zero then, and our statement block to be processed if condition zero is true. However, if condition zero is false, we move on to the next one, sort of like what we did with else. But instead of if, we say else if. So it's if this, then do this. Else, if this, then do this. Else, if this, then do this, etc., etc. But now, um, you know, we have else if, condition one in this case, then do all this stuff. And that's optional. But you can also have as many of these as you want. You can also have the else part with all the else ifs. But you don't need else. You can have if, else if, else if, else if, and then do nothing if none of the conditions are met. But if you do put an else statement, then you have statements that are processed if none of the conditions are met, if, no, if all of them are false. So without else, but with else ifs, if everything comes out to be false, nothing happens. If you do put an else in, if every condition comes out to be false, then the else happens. And then end if at the very end. With this else if stuff, exactly one of the statement blocks is run no matter how many of the conditions actually are true, because Visual Basic is going to test the conditions in order, starting at, in this case, condition zero. It'll test that, and then condition one, and then condition two, and then condition three, and so on and so forth. It will, contest, it will test all of the um, conditions in order. And the statement block of the first true condition is run. Every other statement block is ignored. So if condition three is the first statement block that is true, but conditions three, four, five, six, seven, and eight are all true, only condition three's statement block gets run. Four, five, six, seven, and eight all get ignored. Here is some example code that sets a message equal to whether a particular number is divisible by 8, 4, uh, 2, and is odd. It's not divisible by 2 at all. Um, with some extra fun stuff, but we'll get there. So first, let's say I have the number 16. Well, 8 divides evenly into 16. There's no remainder whatsoever. 8 times 2 is 16. 16 divided by 8 is 2 remainder 0. So the mod is equal to 0. This condition is true. String message gets set to the number is divisible by 8. And then we just move on. We don't worry about any of these other else ifs. Notice, however, 16 is divisible by 8 and 4 and 2. So all these, all these conditions are true, but only the first one actually happens. And then it skips everything else. If I had 12, 12 is not divisible by 8. 12 divided by 8 is equal to 1 remainder 4. Which means that 12 mod 8 is 4, which is not equal to 0. So this whole thing gets skipped. However, 12 is divisible by 4, which means that the 12 mod 4 will be 0. Which means we enter into here. Now, if we are inside of the mod 4 statement block, we know that the first condition was false. Because if it was true, then the second condition wouldn't have even been tested. It would have been completely ignored. 
So that must have been false, which means that it's not divisible by 8. But we are in here, which means that it is divisible by 4. Which is why we can say in the message the number is divisible by 4, but it's not divisible by 8. We have that information. So that's a useful piece of information we can get based on the placement of our conditions here. Similar thing with 2. If we look at 6, for example, uh, 6 mod 8 is going to be 6 because 6 divided by 8 is 0 mod, uh, is 0 remainder 6. 6 mod 4 is going to be 2, but 6 mod 2 is going to be 0 because 2 times 3 is evenly 6. So we say that the number is divisible by, divisible by 2. However, I also have this some odd number thing. We'll get to that. And of course, if it's not divisible by 8, 4, or 2, we go into the else block. I can say the number is odd specifically because up here, there's the previous condition if the number modulus 2 is equal to 0. If that is false, then it's not divisible by 2, which means that it's not even, which means that it must be odd because numbers are either 0 or odd, or even or odd. Uh, 0 has nothing to do with this. Numbers are either even or odd. The modulus is either 0 or 1. Actually, that's what 0 had to do with this. But if it's not divisible by 2, then the number is odd. Now consider instead, if I put int num mod 4 equals 0 at the top, and then the second condition was int, int num mod 8 equals 0, right? This first one is for checking if the number is divisible by 4, and the second one is if the number is divisible by 8. That's fine, but this will never run. We will never enter into this mod 8 part, specifically because 4 is, you know, divides evenly into 8. 8 is divisible by 4. So anything that 8 divides into, 4 also divides into. 16, for example. Uh, 16 was equal to 8 times 2, which is what got us into this statement block in the first place. But in this case, when we're going in order, it will catch that 16 mod 4 is equal to 0 first because 16 is divisible by 4 evenly with no remainder. So the mod 4 is equal to 0, which means that we enter in here and we erroneously tell the user that 16 is divisible by 4 but not by 8, which is a lie because 16 is divisible by 8. So when you have conditions like this, you can use them to your benefit in order to gain information about the values that you're testing against. Sort of like what I'm doing with this divisible by two and some odd number, which I'll get to. But if you do it wrong, if you do things out of order like this, you can actually mess things up. So it's good to be careful about this. You want to sort of uh, have the most specific condition up front because there are you're less likely to find a number that's divisible by 8 than you are to find it divisible by 4. Uh, the actual number of numbers divisible by 8 is the same as numbers divisible by 4 because of infinity shenanigans, but that's a whole other story. Regardless, 8 is the kind of the most restrictive of these conditions because you're more likely to see a number uh, divisible by 4 than 8. So if we want to sort, you know, every number divisible by 8 is divisible by 4, but there are also numbers divisible by 4 that are not divisible by 8, like 12, uh, or 20, or things like that. So you want to keep it like this, where we have this most restrictive condition up here, and then you have a less restrictive condition where you're like, okay, well, I know this about whatever the number is. I can get that the number is divisible by 4, but not by 8, which also you could say that the number is divisible by 4 and some odd number, but that's a whole other story again. So with the whole divisible by 2 and some odd number, right? Let's say that we got here int num, and whatever int num actually was, let's say, you know, I'm seeking a contradiction right here. So let's say that it was divisible, divisible by 2 and some even number x. 
but because x is even, it's going to be equal to some 2 times y. For example, 2 is even, 2 is equal to 2 times 1. 8 is even, 8 is equal to 2 times 4. 12 is even, 12 is equal to 2 times 6, and so on and so forth, right? So we have some even number x, which is equal to 2 times y, such that 2 times x equals our number right here. But the problem is, is that if it's divisible by both 2 and x, that means it's divisible, you know, it's divisible by 2 times x, which means that it's divisible by 2 times 2y, which means that it's divisible by 4y, which means that it's divisible by 4, and it would have been caught up here. And because it wasn't caught up here, then it must not have been divisible by 4. So therefore, it has to be 2 times some odd number, not some even number. That's an example of information that you can get by a smart usage of these ELSIF blocks like this. So that can be really helpful. You can also do the same thing with, with ranges. In your first condition, you say, if the number is between 1 and 3, then do this. In the second condition, you can say, well, if it's between 0 and 5, do this. And then if it's between negative 10 and 10, do this, right? But in the first condition, if it's between 1 and 3, we're doing something. If we make it to the second condition where it's between 0 and 5, we know that it's not between 1 and 3, so it must be 0, 4, or 5. And you can do really cool things like that to filter out certain groups of numbers. And then make some crazy, like, big ranges that are actually kind of split up and stuff. It's, it's really interesting. So this gives you a lot of power. Alright, so what we have right here is an example of this warehouse program. Uh, one of them is using the nested selection structures that we talked about before, nested if statements. And the other one is using this else if variant of the if statement. And look how much cleaner version 2 is. Uh, for one, you, you have this whole three and if clauses are required, right? Because you have three separate if statements, and each of those if statements requires three end ifs. But also imagine how wacky the um, code would get if you had 12 warehouses or 200 warehouses or something like that. So this nested can be a little bit inefficient. However, you have one statement block per warehouse designation in the um, else if version of our if statement right here, which makes things a lot more compact and makes it a lot easier to read. Uh, you only have one level of indentation here versus all these levels of indentations in the nested version. And again, if you had 200 warehouses, that requires 200 of these nested if statements. Imagine how far off the screen that would go. So nested can provide you a lot of benefits, or sorry, Else if can provide you a lot of benefits. Nested does have its moments, but it's good to avoid when you can. Now we have another multiple alternative selection structure that's called the select case statement. And it functionally, it's the same as an if then else, but sometimes there are times where it's easier to write one of these select case statements, um, especially when you have a lot of different cases, you know, a lot of different conditions that you have to check and all that kind of stuff, a lot of different branches, but, you know, all of them are pretty simple. They're not great for more complicated conditions, but when they're more simple, um, these are a fantastic alternative. So what you do with a select case statement is you type select case, and then you pass in a selector. Now this is an expression that's going to produce some kind of value. It's not a Boolean condition in the way that an if statement works, but rather you can think of it as like the left hand side of an if statement's condition. You're just typing in the left hand side right here, the thing that you're trying to test. And then you have a whole bunch of cases. You would type case and then the expression for the first thing you're trying to test. So the right hand side of the first if condition. And then a whole bunch of statements, sort of like what happens in, in an if statement. And then case, uh, 
and you do the next expression that you're trying to test against, and then a whole bunch of statements. So this would be the right-hand side of the second if statement, and so on and so forth. And it works like how the if, else if, else if, else if stuff does, where the first expression that ends up being true, in this case, um, not even true, but what happens is that it tests equality against each of these expressions. So does selector equal expression zero? If true, run all that, get out of there. If false, test if selector uh, matches case expression one. If true, run all that uh, and get out of here. If false, move on to expression two, test if selector matches expression two. If true, run all that kind of stuff. If false, uh, go on to the next one and so on and so forth. If none of the expressions actually match the selector, then if a case else statement exists, which you don't need, but if it does, uh, it will go into there and a whole bunch of statements will be run if nothing matches. Um, usually you're going to have at least one case, probably more. Otherwise, why would you have, um, like, why not just do an if statement that has only the true path? But you'll have at least one case, probably more. Uh, the else case is optional. Any of the cases past the first is optional. And then at the very end, you type end select. For example, with the warehouse problem that we've been working on, we have case A. If string warehouse is equal to A, uppercase A, and we're assuming we've, you know, string warehouse has already been trimmed in uppercase and all that kind of stuff. But if this is equal to case A, then the label says Tennessee. Otherwise, if it's equal to case B, uh, the label will say Kentucky. If it's equal to case C, the label will say Louisiana. If it's equal to case D, the label will say Louisiana. Otherwise, if it doesn't match any of these, if someone types in E or blah or 200 or whatever, uh, the text will say N slash A, not applicable. Now, you might have noticed something about all of these, specifically the fact that case C and case D do exactly the same thing because they exist in the same state. But yet we have to specify two different cases because they're two different expressions. So unfortunately, we do have to do that repetitive work, which is, you know, very unfortunate. Psych! We can combine it. We have case C comma D, which means either or not even either, but um, if string warehouse matches C or string warehouse matches D, I guess either works because it can only be equal to one of these. But if string warehouse equals C or string warehouse equals D, then set the text equal to Louisiana. They're both doing the same thing, so we can combine them using this comma. Otherwise, it's the same, but we have this comma right here, we get to make what's called an expression list, where we can put all of the expressions, which remember include literal values like what we're using here, but every single expression that does the same thing, as long as it's okay if we only match one of them, or if we at least match one of them, right? As long as it's okay that we match at least one of them to do the thing, and not all of them because equality. As long as we match one of them. And we can do that thing that all of them do, I guess. Uh, then we can use that expression list and it'll work really well. And it saves us a lot of typing. This is partially why, you know, it's really helpful to do case statements when we have very simple conditions like this. Like string warehouse equals A, string warehouse equals B, string warehouse equals C, or string warehouse equals C, and so on and so forth. This saves us a lot of time. We get to save time by writing out the simple select case statement, and the Visual Basic does have to convert it into basically an if statement uh, in order to do all that. But we get to save time and make the computer do the work. That's what automation's all about. That's what programming's about. So select case statements are really cool. Now, the selector and the case expressions have to be of the same type because you're testing equality. If they're different types, you're not going to make a match at all. The expression lists, like I said before, act like or, not and. So the string warehouse equals C or string warehouse equals C if, you know, if this statement is true, 
Meaning if either, not not even either. Well, if if string warehouse equals C, or if string warehouse equals C, if this is true, or if this is true, or both are true, not, both will not be true unless they're the same value. But as long as at least one of these is true, the expression list, you know, will work, and you'll be able to go into the case associated with that expression list. It's not and because that would be disastrous. Specifically in this case, right? If this was if string warehouse equals C and string warehouse equals D, that would never be true because it can't be C and D at the same time. So it's or not and. Now, if the selector matches multiple cases for whatever reason, only the first match is used. Uh, and if no case else and no selector match, if, if the selector doesn't match any cases and there's no else case, then you just skip the select case entirely. Now you can actually do ranges of values inside of a case clause, which is really helpful. For example, um, you can do case is, and then some kind of comparison operator, and then an expression. Um, which means that if the selector comparison operator expression is true, then it matches. So for example, uh, if, if we're testing some integer and we say case is greater than 10, comparison operator being greater, expression being 10, case is greater than 10, that case would be matched if the integer was greater than 10, for example, 11 or 15 or something. And if it was less than 10, it would not match and we would skip that case. We also have case um, blank to blank, where you know we have some expression that gives us a lower value and some expression that gives us an upper value. So case lower value to upper value means that anything between the lower value and the upper value inclusive is going to be included. Case 1 to 10 um, is going to match 1, 2, 3, etc, cetera, etc, cetera, 9, 10. But 11 or 0 are going to be excluded. For example, we have a quantity uh, based unit price calculator where if someone's ordering a lot of items from us, we give them a deal on the unit price of the items that we're selling. Unit price being price per unit. So uh, we, we're selecting uh, on int quantity. We're testing what the quantity is. If quantity is between 1 to 5, we set the unit price to $25. Otherwise, if it's between 6 to 10, we set it to 23. Otherwise, if it's greater than 10, we set it to 20. Otherwise, we set it to 0 because the quantity is 0, they haven't bought anything, or something went wacky with a negative number. And then we end select like that. Now, we know that int quantity is an integer, thanks to the int, which means, you know, our ranges here are inclusive. We know that 10 is included right here, which means that up here, we're going to start counting 11 as the smallest number, 12, 13, 14. We're, we're talking about integers. There's no 10.1, 10.01, anything like that. The next number is 11. So because of that, we could say is greater than or equal to 11, and that would do the same thing. Either one is fine. Uh, I love doing is greater than 10, personally. Other people would do greater than or equal to 11, and that would feel better for them. That's up to you. But you have options when you're able to figure out, like, you know, you're able to make these conclusions based on the type, in this case, of your selector. All right, well, that's additional selection structures. Uh, this is going to give you a lot of power within your code, so I hope this is something that's really exciting for you. We have one last video, uh, relatively fast. It's just giving you another really useful tool that I hope will come in handy.